Hello. Thanks for joining our virtual conference on EV engineering. I'm Chris from Charge. We're thrilled to welcome back Sandy Moreau for the keynote session on next generation EV technologies. Sandy also presented two great keynote sessions at our September conference, uh, one comparing 10 leading EV motors and another uh, comparing Tesla's inverter technology versus other BEVs. Uh, you can find both of those presentations uh, on our website. So if you missed them, I uh, encourage you to go watch them. We got a lot of great feedback. Uh, also, at the end of this session, we'll have a live Q&A. So click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit a question for Sandy at any point. Uh, the slides will also be available to download. And we will post a link in the chat box uh, to the PDF of the slides. And we'll also post links uh, to Sandy's two September sessions there. So you can find them there as well. So without further further ado, please welcome Sandy Moreau. Welcome. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you again, uh, Charge TV, for, uh, for bringing me on board to give another speech um, on what I think might be um, worthwhile. So first off, um, my name is Sandy Monroe. I'm with uh, Monroe & Associates, um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an EV outlook on what I think next generation technology opportunities are. I will tell you that I'm only going to be talking about four. The growth of mega castings, new battery technologies, solid state hydrogen, blah, blah, and also VTOLs. Um, I'm really not going to go into things that I think are, are really important, but n beyond my kin. And that is the, uh, what I see as the next generation of real growth, and that's going to be strictly into the, um, into the CAD, um, sorry, not the CAD, but um, into the um, software development that we're going to need for, uh, for all of the next generation vehicles. Um, so I would like to start here at the beginning, and the beginning basically for mega castings is this baby right here. This is the original mega casting that came out inside the Model Y that we tore down, which was early in 2019. This was, as far as I was concerned, a dramatic step forward, but it was just the beginning. The mega casting on the Model Y had over, got rid of over 70 stamp parts off the Model 3, there were hundreds of fastening operations that they got rid of, a whole bunch of assembly steps, 14 stations, I believe, uh, complete with robots and complicated fixtures. That's one sixth of the whole Model 3 Tesla shop that disappeared when they went to this mega casting. That was sensational, but it was just the beginning. So the first thing you need to know is the guys who make the machine, the Giga Press, um, that would be IDRA. IDRA was founded in 1946, it's uh, well known in the industry as being a, a really good uh, supplier of very excellent machinery. They had to do some modifications in order to make the uh, mega casting work. They installed it at uh, the Tesla Fremont plant and also in Shanghai. There's more coming, but those are the ones that they started off with. It's big and the aluminum alloy shot that it uses about 104 kilograms, which is about 231 pounds. This is a really sensational machine, but it was only the beginning. This is what the uh, material looks like. Um, many people have said many things. Most of them didn't do their own checking, but we did. So what we found was that this is an A386 uh, material. 386 material is, um, is something that not too many people use. We found that there was extra ingredients in this that uh, made it so that it would be quite a bit better for, uh, for molding. And as uh, has been mentioned uh, several times, it takes milliseconds to fill up that mold. Then, six months ago, we got a little note from Mr. Musk saying, um, we'll be amazed to see this operation. And what he was talking about was not a single casting, but a double casting. A double casting that was shot on a next generation and the next generation of the Idra Press. Unbelievable. This, getting rid of these two parts and all the little connecting parts that were in between it, that eliminated another 90% of the operations that had to be done in order to put this thing into place. That was, uh, that was then. 6,000 tons 
I never even knew that there was that big a press that could be manufactured. Now what you're looking at is the front, the center, and the rear of the, what we would call the platform, the, car, the car's platform. That never was done before. No one's done this. This is amazing. Everyone has maybe toyed around a little bit, but nobody has ever come up with anything like this. I was blown away. And then the Cybertruck news. We'll need to order some more equipment to make the Cybertruck. That's what Elon said. Well, guess what? This is what it's looking at. An 8,000 ton mega casting, uh, sorry, mega press. That, that machine is absolutely huge, huge. 8,000 tons, nobody has ever even proposed such a thing. So I think that there's many people that are watching here that are actually technically inclined and may, may want to try and help their company out a bit. So um, Ricardo Ferrero, he was the guy who basically made the announcement telling everybody that, um, that the Hydra Press, the first of this technology has ever come out. He did that on March 16 this year. Now, I can tell you that if you really want to get into contact information, you might want to talk to Mr. Stokes, his, uh, his um, um, email address is right there. But for the rest of you, for everybody that, that really wants to see a good vi video, Go to the YouTube video that's on the bottom of the screen here, download it, get a, get a chance to look at 45 minutes of pure engineering delight. So let's talk a little bit more about what some of the other things are that, that are sitting out there. So, so <clears throat> to quote Scar Star Trek, Scotty, we need more power. Well, everybody's betting on different things. What's your bet going to be? There's the 4680, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Solid state and hydrogen. So let's start with the 4680. So <clears throat> on Tesla battery day, not so long ago, uh, Tesla gave us a lot of good information, which Monroe used to try and develop our best guess. So this is our best guess in back of me. This is what we thought was going to happen. We talk to people about it and whatnot. This was our little prof prophecy that we had on Monroe Live. And from that prophecy, we thought we, might be, thought we might be close. Well, actually, this is a picture um, that, uh, that came to me somehow. And this picture basically shows exactly what we came up with. The only difference being we thought that the, um, the cabling would be on the outside, but actually it's on the inside. That, that uh, 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 bright, shiny thing you see on the left-hand side of your screen, that's actually a collector that, that comes from all the rest of the things. So the, a little bit different, but in actuality, it's really close to being, uh, we, we, we came pretty close. So let's have a look at what I think is the best, uh, best product out on the market today. And um, I'd like to thank uh, Fred Jessup for uh, sending us a couple of these things. This is uh, what the, the, the true 4680 battery looks like. Now this is a, a stereolithography model, but at the end of the day, these 3D models are, are quite, uh, quite handy for describing how things, how things are working or going to work in the future. This is what I think is probably going to be the world beater because, because of some of the different financial aspects of what's going on. So let's have a look at why I keep talking about Tesla. Why is it? And that's because the Tesla folks think ahead. They're looking at 10 terawatts of power by 2025. 10 terawatts of, and they did that in 2019. How in the world could they think that far ahead? I think it's because what they're looking at is the market in total instead of looking at what's happening in my own little sandbox. So with that in place, let's have a look at what's going on with solid state. And there's a lot of big bets that are going on. Big bets, VW, Mercedes, Ford, everybody is betting the farm on a technology that's been unsuccessfully worked on since the 1920s. Why? Because the upset is so vast. It is amazing what can happen if we can get to a solid state battery. One, it's, trying, it's like trying to get uh, to glue potato chips together with two-way tape. It, it has a tendency to break and stuff like that. 
The, the other real problem with it, well, there's two other problems. One is dendrites that have a tendency to grow inside of the, uh, inside of the product. And the last one is it's very difficult to make these things work at room temperature. So let's have a look. So this is basically what you're looking at with a standard lithium ion battery, okay? And this is what we see all the time. Now you'll notice there's some blue stuff there. That blue stuff basically is an electrolyte, uh, liquid electrolytes. And those kinds of electrolyte solutions are great, but they weigh uh, extra and uh, they've got some other issues that are associated with them that we really don't want. But if we went to solid state or if we could go to solid state, you'll see that things look a little different. There's a couple of connectors missing. These kinds of things make it a lot easier and better if you're going to a solid state or a solid electrolyte. If we think about what could happen here, we're looking at faster tar charging times, like 10 times faster. We're looking at an energy density that could go from 2x to 8x. We've got ranges that could go who knows how far, and it's lighter weight. So if I just have the same amount of density, okay, that's fine. Uh, like a same sort of a package, but at the end of the day, if I want more, it's not a big deal because it's quite a bit lighter. That stuff is very, very interesting. And then we've got the last one, which is non-combustible. This is, this is a lower temperature kind of a product, if I can lower the temperature. This is, a, this is a, the type of product that we could get into in a hurry. And also it minimizes the use of uh, some pretty toxic materials. Solid state challenges, uh, there's a whole bunch. Um, it's expensive right now uh, for a kilowatt hour. It's projected to be at $400, uh, $400 uh, dollars at, uh, per kilowatt hour by 2026, and that's quite a bit of money. Um, but there's the other options, or the other problems as well, and that's the room temperature performance and the, uh, 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 the formation of these dendrites. Now, I can't talk about this uh, too much. I don't have that much time. So what I'd like you to do is, if you could, there is a very detailed report that MIT has put out, uh, a Dr. Rupp. I don't know her um, or her people, but if you look at the screen, you can see that there's a, mm, a description of what's going on. This, this kind of information would be very important for anybody who's trying to get into this type of a market. Now, what they're showing is a little different than what you'd see at, um, at the two companies that I'm gonna talk about in a minute. Their chemical formula looks quite a bit different than that. But at the end of the day, they all are trying to do and accomplish the same things. So Quantum Escape is the first one that I'm gonna talk a little bit about. Um, their cathode is nickel magnesium cobalt oxide and their anode is basically lithium that's formed in place via charging. This has a, the QuantumScape has a secret sauce, which is their ceramic barrier. This ceramic barrier is kind of a big deal. Um, again, they still have the issues with dendrites, but at the end of the day, they think that their, their uh, ceramic barrier is going to be able to help out. Now, the big backer for them is VW. So there's a company in Louisville, Colorado, and, um, and it's called Solid Power. They have a solid state uh, system that's using um, sulfide solid electrolyte. Now, this is a little different than everybody else has. They're, um, they're looking um, at something that's uh, quite a bit different. And they're also saying that they can get into, uh, into some sort of a production by 2022. They also have a 10 layer pouch, which is kind of a big deal. Um, the barrier thickness that they've got is only 25 microns, and that's pretty thin. Solid power cells are double layered, and that's another big advantage. They're hinting that uh, before entering the market, they're going to have a couple more features um, to their products that are going to make them unique and, um, and special. They also claim uh, room temperature, 20 degrees C, which is about 72, uh, for their solid state battery. So we look at these things and um, you'll notice that they look kind of like this. So these types of pouches are what they think, we think the future is gonna look like with both solid state, or solid power I should say, and quantum scape. So let's, let's take a, a look at somebody that nobody heard of. Okay, so there's a company called LMP. LMP stands for lithium metal polymer. 
LMP is already making this stuff. They're making it for buses and stuff like that. It was a combination of two companies. Quebec Hydro had a company called Blue Solutions and Bellor. Uh, they combined uh, their uh, patents with the guys in Blue Solutions and that added up to about 1,700 patents. And they've commercialized this and they're running the product right now. That thing you see on the right-hand side of the page, that is their solution. That's their manufacturing area. They're really good at, um, at extrusion. So between France and Canada, they've already got something going. And the only difference between them and everybody else with uh, solid state batteries is that this has to be heated up to about 80 degrees C in order to make it work. So that's about 176 degrees if you're talking about Fahrenheit. That's a little bit hot. That would burn your fingers. But at the end of the day, um, it's not over the top. So if I could heat the batteries up, which means kind of I'm probably not going to put it into a car, if I have to heat the batteries up, what will it do for me? Well, according to the guys over at Mercedes, it's a real good idea. They get about 23 hours of full service out of their bus. And that includes a half hour swap with the batteries that are in it. So this is where I, I've mentioned this before. I don't think a battery swap for a, um, uh, the general public is a good idea. But in this particular area, I think this is absolutely brilliant. This is a perfect application for a battery swap. So Mercedes is, uh, Mercedes is building these things right now. They're on the road. They're making them happen. Everything here is a good deal. So then we start talking about Toyota. Okay, now Toyota's the big dog. Let's face it, they, uh, they make game-changing things. And that's what um, uh, the Nikkei um, basically said um, in one of their articles. Um, and that, that Toyota's got a game-changing kind of uh, product and it's going to be, uh, it's going to have prototypes rolling out in mid-2025. Uh, uh, okay, uh, that's a long time from now. Um, and what are they going to roll out in? Oh, a Prius. Hmm. I think that maybe Toyota has had too much exposure to U.S. marketing. I, I think that what they need to do is, um, this should be as, uh, as exciting and as different as the Mirai. Certainly not that. So maybe they'll change their mind on it because, quite frankly, I don't think that a 2025 Prius is the right car to put something that's as revolutionary as what the, um, the solid-state battery will be for Toyota. The other thing is 2025 is a long, long ways away. What's going to happen in the interim? So let's have a look. So what we have here, what we have here is, uh, is a, little, um, a little comparison uh, between all the different kinds of um, uh, solid-state batteries that are out there. So we look over here at uh, the years and we look at, you know, who's got what um, at the top. Uh, so that's everybody that's in the solid-state battery business. And then we've got the Tesla 4680 on the uh, right-hand side. So in uh, year 2021, this year, they're still in kind of like an experimentation mode. If we look at Tesla, um, they're looking at um, 10 gigawatts out of the Cato facility. And then we go to 2022 to 2025, and they're in prototype and refining and yada yada. Well, Tesla is going to be between 100 to 900 gigawatts by 2025, or during 2025. And on 2025, they're going to have limited start of production for the rest of the groups, Tesla is going to have a terawatt. And by 2030, they're going to have three or four terawatts. So who wins? Financially, this does not require um, uh, a deep understanding of uh, financial terms. It looks to me like uh, Tesla is going to have um, a walk away because if they have three to four terawatts that they can generate, Everybody's going to be buying from them. And quite frankly, there's the other aspect. How much of a differential is there? So the show me the money thing is kind of like what I like uh, to talk about. So Elon Musk said that, um, you know, his uh, product is going to be work, working like, a, like a, a commercial truck. He's looking for a million mile life. 
It's got current bottle, uh, sorry, battery modules that last 300 to 500,000 miles. So we're looking at 1,500 cycles. And they're not talking anymore about re replacing modules. They're, they're, they're talking about, or sorry, the whole battery pack. They're talking about modifying modules a little bit, and that's gonna cost maybe five to $7,000 to keep your car on the road. So let's talk about what, that's, that's Elon's talking, let's talk about what Monroe had to say. In 2018, we calculated the price per kilowatt on the older Tesla Model 3 is about 132 bucks. In April of 2020, Monroe calculated the price per kilowatt hour on the Model Y. We analyzed it at about $92. Now we're a year later. Um, we've gone through and looked at the componentry and uh, the cost of the materials and stuff like that. And now we're looking at $83 per kilowatt hour. Bottom line, Monroe projects that the price per kilowatt hour when we get to 2025 is going to be around 50 bucks or less. That doesn't leave a lot of space for somebody coming in at a price that could be astronomical because how many years have they been under development? How successful will they be? On and on and on. Smart money again is for my money, for my money, is, uh, is what we're looking at with Tesla. So let's talk about the last one, which is hydrogen. This is the most plentiful element in the universe. So why is it so hard for us to get going? Hydrogen has been the uh, power of the future since its, uh, since its discovery by Robert Boyle in 1671. I don't know what Billy Boyle had in, uh, in mind, but um, it didn't quite work out quite the way he thought. This is very plentiful kind of uh, element, but it's attracted to almost everything. And once it sticks, it sticks like a blood sucking relative. It's very difficult to get hydrogen out of water. I mean, there's lots of, lots of hydrogen in there, H2O. I mean, there's lots, of, there's lots of hydrogens, but tearing it away from the rest of the hydrogen and whatnot, it's expensive. That's kind of like what's, uh, what's going on here. So we got solid state virgin versus hydrogen. Solid state battery development is outpacing hydrogen fuel cells. And the reason for that is because of the way we think of hydrogen. So yes, the, the Hindenburg was, uh, was kind of an issue, but let's let bygones be bygones. We're not, we're not gonna be doing anything quite like what they did uh, in the 30s. So let's look at the advantages. Refueling times are in minutes. I mean, even at the most dramatic, I pull out one bottle, put in another bottle, and I'm done. The inherent energy density has a, great, a giant advantage at uh, 1,250 um, watt hours per liter. It's also long range. Its focus, I think, should be on commercial trucks initially. So why are there disadvantages? Well, number one, as I mentioned with the Hindenburg, there's fear. Um, it's had a lot of bad press. It costs as high currently. It, there's a lack of good fuel cell technology. I'll talk about Tesla, who's got the best, or sorry, not Tesla. I'll talk about Toyota, who's got the best, coming up. There's a lack of fuel infrastructure, basically a lack of interest. So when the Toyota Mirai came out, I thought this was wonderful. At 1.3 volts, that was better than everybody. We had worked on lots of different, um, uh, we've worked on lots of different fuel cells. And quite frankly, 0 0.8, 0 0.9 was about the best we could get. We could never get to one volt. And the problem is, it's very difficult to make their system. It's, <laughs> It's the reason that the, uh, the Toyota BMW um, arrangement kind of like fell apart. So what we have to do is see what, what's going on with the Tesla, or sorry, the Toyota uh, process. Ch check that out and try and figure out some new way of getting the fuel. Well, this is what's the fuel, this is the way the fuel was gonna work with the, uh, with the Toyota product using um, high pressure tanks. These are very similar to the ones that we use uh, for rocket, uh, sorry, space. Space uses hydrogen tanks that look almost identical to this. This is how a PEM um, fuel cell works. Now, polymer, electrolyte, membrane, PEM, that's kind of a big topic and I don't have too much time. So I'm going to let this go and again, I'd like to send you off to have a look at uh, the internet so that you can download the information, the real information, so that you know how this stuff actually works. So 
Again, proton exchange membrane is another term that you might want to explore. So when it comes to Toyota, um, the only contender that I know about that maybe has legs is High Point. And this is a California company, and they have an air-cooled um, hydrogen fuel cell power train that produces um, quite a bit of energy and whatever. Um, this, is, uh, this may be a good uh, application. And I think the best thing for it would be VTOLs, small aircraft, vertical takeoff machines. High Point, um, uh, their, their, uh, their next power, power train is supposed to like quadruple the amount that they can get out. And this would be perfect for that type of application. So how do we get to uh, hydrogen? Um, there is no easy way to use uh, or to get hydrogen if we use conventional methods. I, I mean, it's expensive, it's uh, not efficient, on and on. But uh, there's a guy named Dr. Paul Smith, and he may have another way, okay? So what we're looking at here with his company called uh, Plasma Kinetics is light-activated hydrogen. This is a different way of uh, making things happen, okay? And if this works, and I'm thinking it does because they're already doing it, um, it'll be more economical than batteries, more energy than batteries, lighter than batteries, smaller than batteries, zero emission, and 100% recyclable, whereas batteries currently are around 4 to 14, depending on what kind of battery you're looking at or who you talk to. <clears throat> so there's a lot of advantages. This has stored energy, and it's released with basically a laser light. There's no pressurization, no flammability, none of that stuff. It's quick charging. Um, you swap out these plates in about five minutes. There's multiple um, ways of recharging the source, um, basically through uh, wastewater treatment facilities, incinerators, um, all kinds of nasty stuff that uh, we just let go into the, uh, into the atmosphere. These are the kinds of ways that we would probably figure out how to get this recharging source in place. So this stuff here, as I mentioned, it's safe, it's economical, it's transformable, it's quiet, and you get 100 of recharges, and it's, like I said before, almost 100% recyclable. So how does it work? Well, basically what you're doing is you're sending a light through, let's just call it a laser to make things easy, and it basically is running on a, a compact disc or other, some, some other substrate that spins, and from that, we wind up with, um, we wind up taking the hydride out and, uh, or sorry, by looking at a hydrate, we remove the hydrogen that's inside. So let's have a look at one of the little boxes that they've got here. This is a light activated um, hydrogen storage mobile canister. So this mobile canister is about 19 by 15 inches. Um, and it's, uh, it has, like I said before, that light activated film. This 18 pound mobile unit has uh, 252 grams of hydrogen. And that's good for about 5.5 kilowatt hours. Let's look at what we could do. So right now what we're looking at is that little teeny tiny thing that I showed you. Then you've got a box of four and then you can stand this up and turn it into some sort of stationary power device. I like this idea. If we can make this work, I would definitely be saying that this is probably a more viable option than anything I've seen for VTOLs, Class A trucks, and stationary power. So if we look at the comparison, and I don't have time to really go through all of the comparisons, but you'll be getting this uh, presentation, I'm sure. So you can go in there and you can dissect and have a look where you think you, you like it. Um, anything that you could do to help us out by saying, oh, I don't like this or that can't be right, fine, send it to me. I'd like to, uh, I'm always in for a debate. I, and I'm always interested in looking at what it is that we can do to make, a, make the world a better place. So if we look at um, the different, um, the different um, aspects or the different medias that we can look at for getting the job done, you can see that quite a, quite a few things are better when you, when you look at a hydrogen fuel cell especially if we're looking at the smaller, uh, sorry, not the smaller thing, not a car. I, I don't recommend it for cars, just why bother? These are great for VTOLs, heavier, larger uh, vehicles, ships, 
and, and basically commercial units. So <clears throat> I'm gonna skip this slide. So you can uh, get some information from um, uh, J.R. Song, and there's all the information that, uh, that we have. So you can uh, get in there and seriously have a chat with him. He's the representative in Korea. That, uh, that's where this is all being, uh, this is all where it's coming from. So I, I'd suggest that you talk to him if you're interested. So last one, where's my flying car? Okay, the VTOLs are not exactly George Jetson's flying car, but they're a lot closer than an SUV. VTOLs are my first choice for future of travel. So if we look, um, I had a prediction back um, when uh, the 100th anniversary of the car came out in 1996. In 1996, I said that um, the future of travel is going to be basically, um, going to be basically this, um, which basically looks like, uh, you know, your dad's easy chair or whatever. And, um, and it's going to be, um, it's going to be basically run by your brain. Um, the power for this thing, I thought, was going to come from clouds uh, that were uh, hovering over the earth and sending, uh, sending impulses straight to, uh, straight to earth. Something like what uh, Nikola Tesla tried to put into place, but um, uh, was uh, stymied because the guys who were in charge couldn't figure out how to charge us uh, for, for the, the privilege of them generating electricity. This prediction um, in uh, 1996 uh, didn't meet with a whole lot of enthusiasm. If you uh, pull that article up from Automotive uh, Engineering, if you're an SAE member, you should be able to get it. But if you pull that up from 1990, September of 1996, you can have a look at what people in 96 thought. And basically, they thought of things like a big V8 engine. Everyone loves that. So uh, my prediction um, really uh, didn't do anything for my credibility at that time. Um, but what we did do at Monroe was we, we made a PAVE, a personal air vehicle. And um, we developed it. It looks like this. OK, so. Um, this, this is the model that we made. It's seat five. It had a gas engine in this one, but we also looked at a diesel. And <clears throat> we put batteries in the, uh, in, in, if we put batteries into the wing box, um, we could put the electric motor right on the uh, propulsor, the fan that's at the back of this thing. We thought we really had something. Unfortunately, we were a little early into the market um, that was in 2008. And unfortunately, in 2008, the banks all melted, and our key sponsor <coughs> was Lehman Brothers. They were going to give us a half a billion dollars to put this plane into, into business, basically. It was highly automated. You did not need to fly this. You just told it where you wanted to go, and it did what it did. That was good then, but now VTOLs, I think, are the much better way of getting from point to point a, this, this would be great if you're going a long distance, like two or 300 miles, but for inside a city, a VTOL is absolutely brilliant. So will VTOLs take off? Well, this is a slide that we made in 2006 or seven, showing basically that there was, there was thousands, over 10,000 airports that, that would easily handle a plane of our size. That that, that amount of airports, that amount of, of, of ability to travel, that was amazing as far as we were concerned. But really and truly, most people don't go to, they don't need to go 200 miles normally. They don't need to do that. What they need to do is get from here to there, and if you're in Los Angeles, getting from here to there, mm, not a chance. It's almost as bad if you uh, kind of go to uh, Atlanta and things like that. So a VTOL. I go up in the air, I move, I go down. Think of this, think of this. When you drive your self-driving car, or when the car, your self-driving car is driving, it has two feet of separation on either side, two or three feet. You have whatever the speed uh, limit is ahead of you and in back of you, depending uh, on, on the situation, anywhere from 10 feet to maybe uh, 50 feet. But with an air, with a VTOL, 
you're going to be five or 600 feet apart. It'll drop you like a dime right on the spot that you need to go. But at the end of the day, there's huge amount of separation. Why wouldn't we be looking at VTOLs? So GM is looking at a flying car. Hyundai is looking at a car, uh, sorry. So GM is looking at a, uh, a flying car. I, I think that it should be a VTOL. Hyundai is looking at a VTOL. FCA, now Stellantis, has a partnership with Archer Aviation to make VTOLs by 2023. Toyota, almost 400 million in investments in VTOLs. At the end of the day, I believe that this is where the real opportunities are for the next generation, uh, the next generation of transportation. So as Jules Verne said, think of the possibility, the speed, the convenience, the personal space, the COVID environment, air cargo, delivery solutions, emergency response. There's a ton of things that are going on here and they're not going to go away and they're certainly being watched by the commercial and the defense groups rather than personal transportation. So at the end of the day, Hyundai thinks that, um, that there's going to be a need for um, one of these uh, service ports that they're showing here. Very snappy looking, um, an air cargo version uh, by 2026. I'd put more money on that than, uh, than, uh, than I would on maybe going to some of the other technologies that I've seen in the, uh, in the last little while. I think that, um, I think that, like I said, I think that VTOLs are the wave of the future. Now, how do I make these things and make them at a profit? Well, here you go. 3D printing on a large scale. This is the way that you can make things happen. Divergent has a 3D car chassis. Actually, I've seen some really magnificent cars, the whole car, all done using, uh, using 3D print, large 3D printing uh, scales. So I believe that really and truly this is what we've got going on here. This is an enabler. Um, the other enablers, obviously, good battery packs, because even if you go with uh, any of the other technologies, you're still going to need a, 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 a pack if you're going to go with a fuel cell. So at that, I would like to uh, close it down. Thank you so much. Um, I hope that uh, the rest of the conference goes well for all you folks. And um, if, you, if you have questions or whatever, you have my uh, email address there, or you can go to Monroe Live or LeanDesign.com to, uh, to uh, pick up or, or express your, your interest. Thank you so much, and I'll accept questions now. Hello. Thank hey, you for that presentation. Back. Hey, no problem. I, um, I, I did have something that I wanted to add, a couple of little uh, tidbits. I knew that there was going to be um, some exciting new news coming out, but I wasn't allowed to actually address it until, um, until this thing aired. So I wanted, to, um, I wanted to just bring everybody's attention to a couple of things. Um, one, talking about, um, uh, talking about the, um, the scalability of the, um, the scalability of the um, uh, solid state batteries. Now, in that picture, you saw something about this size. This is what everybody's hoping to get, <clears throat> hoping to get out of a, um, a solid state battery. But let's look at what it is that they've got right now. This, this is it. Only this is twice as big as what they can come up with. That's why we're looking at a long time in the future. The, it's not even a watch battery. It's a, it's a battery that you'd put inside of a, um, a hearing aid that would be about the, uh, the most amount of power that we can get out right now. That means, like people, are, I've seen some of the questions and whatnot. Some of the people are asking, well, how long is this for real? How long is it going to take? And things like that. At the end of the day, mm, this is really tiny. It's going to take a lot to get it to the size of the pouch that we're looking at here. Okay, So it's important that you know that. Secondly, um, people are asking about what's the chemical composition of the, um, this is the, basically the uh, 4680 battery in miniature or in a, in, a, in a little 3D model. 
nobody really knows for sure. I mean, Tesla doesn't uh, <laughs> doesn't doesn't send me Christmas cards with uh, with that information in it. So, quite frankly, we're looking at um, we're looking at chemical composition that they're keeping to themselves. And well, I should. It's a secret, and that's kind of like what uh, what we need to what we need to have when we talk about um, we talk about um, the um, the batteries themselves. And I, um, I know that everybody's saying, hey, the battery swaps and things like that. We got a little video we'll show you at the end if you want that shows uh, battery swapping from 1943. Not a new concept. Anyway, we'll wait until the end, but here's a guy right here that, uh, that you guys should know more about. If you have a battery problem um, on a Tesla or pretty much anything else, Gruber Motor Company is where you want to go and talk to. These guys are doing what you could buy a brand new battery pack for maybe 22, 26 grand, or you can take it to this guy or people like him. And guess what? You're going to wind up with a two grand bill, $2,000, $3,000 to have your car back up to maybe 80% because he's figured out trick ways of making things happen. Everybody wants to look at the OEMs, but the real innovators, or a lot of the real innovators, they're coming from the fringes. And some of these guys are gonna be able to make things that we're, we can't even dream of right now. And those types of things are, are what's going to really make uh, good things happen in the future. Now, there has been a ton of information that's come out lately about GM and um, SES. <laughs> It didn't even make the news. This is big deal. This is a brand new chemistry for making batteries that nobody's, uh, I've never even heard of before. I, I don't know how it works, but you know what? I do know one thing for sure. The more times you can see people from MIT or some of the other bigger um, technical universities, the more you see these guys come out with new technology, the more likelihood we're gonna have something that we can all afford and is gonna make a big difference. Because all we've been doing, for the, since I've been a kid anyways, for the last at least seven years, how do I perfect an engine? How do I perfect a carburetor or fuel injection or whatever? We haven't been paying enough attention to what other alternate energy sources we've got out there. So um, if you're interested, give me a, send me an email or whatever, and we'll send you as much, uh, as much information, reading material as you want. Um, let me talk about um, <clears throat> let me talk about plasma kinetics. When I um, when I did up the uh, the the presentation, I didn't have a relationship with them. I didn't know really how to contact them and whatnot. That um, that changed just recently, and I've been uh, looking at their stuff and. I can send you, if you want it, um, all the information that you could ever want on, um, on how their process works, how they were mm, basically held back for 10 years by the US government because they wanted to keep it secret. Don't get me going on that. I don't want any questions on how I feel about that, but for 10 years, these people who came up with a great idea <clears throat> were forced to uh, basically go into bankruptcy. So QuantumScape, I, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about them. There's been some um, uh, nasty grams that have uh, gone out by a company called um, Scorpion something or other. Anyway, um, I'm gonna go out and interview these guys in a little while. I'm gonna ask all the same questions that I saw in this video, <clears throat> which, um, basically says it's all baloney. You know what? I've heard that baloney stuff when Tesla came out, but I've heard it dozens of times for companies that are now viable and running. I, I, I can't stand short-sighted, meanie-mouthed uh, kind of characters. Um, so I'm going to go and check this out for real. The last thing before I get, or second last thing, um, BMW um, is talking about what they're gonna be doing. Also in a solid state battery, and they're claiming that they're gonna be able to hit the market a lot sooner. 
Okay, they're, they're talking about a 2025 solid state battery. Ah, I don't know how, I don't know the technology, but I'm gonna find out because that's what I like to do for a living. When you're old, you don't give a rat's, you don't care. You, you're gonna just do what you wanna do. Last, um, I didn't mention these um, capacitors, but it sounds like capacitor technology is coming ahead quicker than I anticipated. So this is a slow, uh, slow ver uh, slower version of what maybe we could be getting into. Supercapacitors for short, Short distances are being used right now. I think that there's uh, any reason, or there's a lot of different reasons why we would be able to look at something like that as opposed to battery packs or fuel cells or what have you. Um, and I, th and I, think, I think that's it. So now what I can do is uh, let me answer your questions. I saw one while we're sifting through to bring the questions up as how do you fix one of these things? Believe me. Uh, this is plenty strong. Uh, if you get smashed into the rear end of your car and you can get past the crush cans and you're into the, basically the, the, the platform, um, you should thank God that you made it because crushing this, not so easy. Uh, crushing steel, not a piece of cake, but easier. A whole platform made of this material is gonna save lives. Now, everybody's saying, oh yeah, what about, <laughs> what about the cost? What about this? How about I wanna live? That's what I want, I wanna live. If I get in a car accident, I wanna live. I don't care about the car, I can buy another, but I wanna live. And that's what I see in using the mega castings. And by the way, I've been pushing them for mm, 30 years. I, uh, that's cool. I've known about Hydra for at least 20 years. So as far as I'm concerned, trying to fix the car, I, no big deal. I can weld that just like I can weld any other piece of aluminum. 386 is a nice material to work with. It flows good, it's strong, lots of good things. Anyhow, got it, got it, got it, got it. And by the way, as far as the, uh, the, the picture there, when I made those two predictions, um, there's a little thing that's Someone glued on the bottom of this picture. This comes out of the health and science out of my only read, which is, um, which is um, this week. Um, and in essence, uh, right down there at the bottom, this little article is saying, hey, we can beam, we can beam electricity or power from space. So every one of the little, little predictions I made back in, um, back in uh, whatever it was, 96, almost all of them have been of some way or another come into fruition. We do have levitation kind of devices, but they're not, uh, they're not practical. And we do have guys working on beaming power from space. And we also have, um, we also have, uh, what do you call it? Um, we also have people working on getting your brain to uh, to run a product, so not not much uh, not much really, except for the the final final delivery of the products. So, anyhow, there you go. So, what's the next question? Um, hey, Sandy, I could uh, yes sift sift through them and, and um, read them sure. to you if you like. A lot yeah, of great ahead. questions. Yeah. Uh, if you have any, uh, please go ahead and click the Q and A button on on your screen and, and send it in to Sandy. So I saw a good one on here. Um, Sandy, please help us understand why OEMs other than Tesla are betting on prismatic cells over cylindrical. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, there's lots of people that are using cylindrical batteries. Um, pouch batteries are um, more expensive, harder to make, um, but they have the potential to get more density. Um, the potential, they don't, really make it work that way. If, uh, if we look at the uh, cars that we've been, so we have two kinds of businesses. We have the kind of business where we'll tear apart a car and, and sell reports and talk about it. The other is quite different. It's all private and uh, nobody knows except the customer. In our um, evaluations, we found that although Prismatic has the capability of giving you more power, 
mm, we haven't really seen it. It doesn't really work that way for us. If you look at all the stats, you'll see that Toyota, sorry, not Toyota, um, Tesla, even though it says it's got uh, X number of kilowatt hours, it seems to outperform the one that's got, in some cases, almost double. How, how is that? What, what's going on there? Are they lying? It's just the way that energy is used up in these two different sources. And quite frankly, cylindrical, I can make them by the millions. They shoot out there like little machine gun bullets. Prismatic, slower, more cumbersome, not my first choice. Gotcha. Sorry. Yeah, I believe uh, uh, Rivian just announced that they're using uh, cylindrical cells in their truck. I, I know everything about the Rivian battery pack, um, everything. <laughs> uh, we were, yeah, so yes, they use 2170s. They've got a great way of cooling and um, that's it. Next <laughs> is the- <laughs> That's the private ones. You yeah, can't, sure. Only on this side, I can't do them. Uh, is your $83 per kilowatt hour estimate on the battery or pack level or individual cell? It's a pack level. Okay. It, I can't do anything on the cell level, pack level. One question about, um, what do you think of tunnels? Do you have any thoughts on the boring company, for example, for future, for the future of transportation? Okay. So, <laughs> all right. So I'm going to tell you, I worked at Ford Motor Company in the olden days. And um, I started off at uh, the Windsor Engine Plant, Windsor Engine Plant 1. There was a Windsor Engine Plant 2. They also had a whole big complex that was torn down a long time ago when they moved the headquarters. Every one of those plants, the foundry, the everything, they were all connected by tunnels. And I was amazed. I never really thought about anything like that before, but Henry the Ford the first loved them. When I went to the States, when I moved from um, engine plant one and two in Windsor and went to the Dearborn engine plant, I got promoted a couple of times. And when I went there, I found out these guys got tunnels and it's all through the whole Rouge. Oh my God, I couldn't believe it. You could walk for days without getting a drop of rain on top of your head. They had tunnels that were so wide that, uh, that whole car bodies at one time used to go. So they didn't, they didn't have to put them on trucks and whatnot. I, I was blown away. I love the idea of tunnels. Uh, anybody that's ever gone to um, any of the major subway systems, Toronto is probably the one I've been at the most where, I mean, underground, you've got, uh, you've got shopping, you've got restaurants, you've got, you can take the subway to wherever you want to go. I'm a big fan. I, I love the idea. It's not popular. I don't know why, but, uh, but, I mean, you go to Europe, they're everywhere. They have, they have subways everywhere and underground, they've got tons of things to do and see and whatever. I, I'm, I'm a big fan. Great, another question here from uh, Robert Boyd. What is your prediction about the harnesses and cables? I believe you were disappointed when you saw the Model Y harnesses and I think you chatted with Elon about that as well. Um, Okay, so there's two different kinds of harnesses. If you look in back of me, um, you can see the power harnesses. And um, so I complained to Elon about uh, communication harnesses. I said, how come you didn't go to the 48 volt system so we could get smaller wires and lighter and stuff like that? And he gave a good answer. Um, but if we have a look at the power, you know, let me get rid of this. Okay, here's a comparison between a Chevy Bolt and a direct com comparison to the um, Tesla Model 3. Now, this one has an extra part that you can't see. This goes here. It happened. And this goes here, okay, versus that one. So when I threw rocks at um, when I threw rocks at uh, Mr. Musk um, on the uh, harnesses for the communications, that's one thing. That is the big bucks. I couldn't. I can't say anything bad about that. That's about as good as it gets. And by the way, we've just recently had a look at the uh, BM. Uh, sorry, the VW um, ID4, and um, and uh, just finished up uh, a small ride and drive kind of a situation where we did a cursory look at the, uh, 
at the Mustang, the Mach-E. The Mach-E, uh, what we see is short cables. On the ID4, not so much. I was disappointed, very disappointed. So. Okay, uh, another question here from Anonymous. Uh, do you have anonymous, <laughs> anonymous, aren't those, aren't those the guys that destroy your computers and stuff? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I'll be nice to this guy. Whatever he wants is the answer is yes. Yeah. Do you, uh, do you have any thoughts on immersion cooling? You mentioned it in the yes. FF video. Very yes. Um, I like Im immersion cooling. Um, you have to do things a little bit differently, but at the end of the day, immersion cooling is a great idea. Um, cooling is the, is the uh, bane for batteries. I mean, you could have a great battery, but if you can't keep it to uh, cool down, you're going to have a problem. And the problem is going to basically mean that you, you lose power, you lose, you lose everything, um, or range, everything starts to disappear if, if the battery starts to get too hot. So, uh, cooling is great. I like, immer I like the concept of immersion cooling. Um, some people are doing it a little bit differently now. It's not actually a fluid, it's a bunch of other different uh, um, techniques using polymers of some kind. But at the end of the day, uh, immersion cooling to me was a, is a real good idea. And we've seen several, actually, we have two or three uh, customers that, have, um, that we're working with on that type of technology. Okay. Are there uh, uh, main, uh, any big drawbacks or, or um, what are the big challenges in, in, in designing an immersion cooling? Well, obviously the first big, <laughs> big challenge is making sure that it doesn't short out. I don't want to mm -hmm. have that happen. So um, um, that would be the most major one. Um, making a sealed box is not a big deal. Everybody can do that. Um, so the, the only thing is how do I cool it without without um, having an issue with, um, with conductivity that I don't want. Okay. What size E motors do you see going into VTOLs? Any idea? Any thoughts there? Big ones. Um, Big. Um, I knew it. I'm going to get stuck picking something up. Hold on a sec. <laughs> charge double okay so um i don't i don't have anything to put this down on can you give me that uh, that rolling doodad <laughs> i knew it I, you know i said i, I bet you somebody's going to ask me about uh wheel motors and uh, uh everybody said no no one will do that oh don't break it come on tyler Jeez. oh my gosh this guy's a brute <clears throat> Now watch this damn thing collapse. <clears throat> okay. Huh, that wasn't so bad, was it? <laughs> Anyhow, this is a this is a cut a cutaway of a wheel motor. Um, this is what we're using on this is what uh, Lordstown is using, not this particular brand, but uh, this is a Protean and they're using Elfie. And so this is what I think I'm gonna want. And about that size, whew, um, for uh, for maybe a four or six blade um, a VTOL, okay? And by the way, anyone out there who wants to work on VTOLs and uh, is looking for a consultant, I'd be happy to help you out. I'm very interested in that technology, but um, I don't wanna do it myself. So this is the kind of thing that we're gonna be looking at. I think that uh, power requirements I would like to have a hundred horsepower about, that would be great uh, for each, uh, for each uh, uh, movable wing. That, that's kind of like where I would be, yeah. Okay, we got a few uh, questions about what uh, email people should uh, reach out to you for the documents that you, you mentioned. Is there, do you have a general email that people could? Uh... Yeah, what's the one that we're using? Oh yeah. Um, Sales at leandesign.com. That that uh, that has people looking at it all the time. That's the easiest one. You send it to mine, and I've got so many filters now that uh, my brother can't even get through. So, 
So anyway, just send it to sales at leandesign.com. Sure. Yep. How advanced is autonomous vehicle technology in EVs and who are the major developers other than Tesla, I guess, would be something we could add in there. Yeah, okay. So um, if you want to see what I had to say about Tesla's uh, full, full, full self-driving, uh, there's a video on Monroe Live. Personally, I was blown completely away. I've never seen anything quite like it. Um, as I mentioned, we had that airplane that was sitting in back of me. That airplane um, took off and landed all by itself. Um, it was great. I, I was really, really happy with it. With VTOLs and the newer technologies, that was in 2008. That's, a, that's like a million years ago in technology terms. Um, now with VTOLs, I believe that we could, uh, we could do pinpoint landings and no one have to do anything, just talk. That's VTOLs. On the road, you've got to have, you got to have some serious software in order to make uh, separation work the way it's supposed to. Um, and I think that, um, I think that um, Tesla is like 10 years ahead of everybody else because they've been working on it for 10 years. But I just heard that Ford is also um, looking to uh, crank something out um, for self-driving, or not self-driving, but uh, uh, for auto um, autopilot. And so is everybody else, but they're kind of like here and uh, Tesla is there. Sure. Um, so I, I was blown away. But if you really want to get a look, not too many people have gotten a chance to show that off. Um, and um, you got to get permission from Mr. Musk himself. Mm -hmm. And I did, so we showed it off. I'm That's really great. impressed with that. I think they've got about 11, uh, sorry, a level four plus kind of wow. version. Next question, any advancements in battery management systems um, and inverters? I think we maybe start with BMS. I, yeah. uh, and I can add on, I think it is, as um, is, is GM announced the, a wireless BMS in their, in their new platform. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that and what kind of advantages that would, that would give. Yeah, okay, so the advanced portion here would be that if you had a wireless battery management system, um, it would eliminate uh, quite a few sensors and uh, well, it might, you might still have the sensors, but you'd get rid of any kind of wiring that would have to connect these things. Battery management is um, critical to uh, making sure that um, your, your car is, is going to run. I mean, at the end of the day, that's, that's like your engine controller in a, in a standard uh, ICE vehicle. It's a big deal. Um, anytime we can move from whatever to Bluetooth, the better off everybody will be, I think, as far as weight and even characteristics. Now there's a bunch of problems associated with it um, and, uh, and no one's been uh, too successful. We propose, we used to work uh, with, an, <laughs> with two nameless um, 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 Formula One companies and uh, and in both cases, that's what we wanted to do. We suggested that we go to um, go to Bluetooth for all of the censoring and whatnot. It uh, didn't fly. And we also, um, well, I've been a big proponent of um, of uh, remote uh, remote signaling and whatnot for things that aren't as as uh, as uh, criti safety critical, like window regulators, rolling up your windows and things like that. Maybe your, uh, maybe your windshield wipers and things. Uh, but uh, so far, no one has really um, reached into their pocket because it, it costs a little bit more uh, to do that sort of stuff. Gotcha. And we, we did, if, if you're really interested and you want a lot of deep stuff, there's, a, there's one, of our, one, of the, one of the Monroe live things uh, talked about, uh, I talked about that. Okay. Uh, got a, a lot of questions about your thoughts on top uh, motor and inverter designs. The, uh, Sandy covered both of those in depth at our September conference, yeah. and uh, you can find both of those uh, links on our website. Um, right. So and, I encourage you nothing, to go watch it. Yeah, and nothing has changed. <laughs> those <laughs> we we've looked at several different um, other uh, motors and inverters, and quite frankly, 
nobody's coming up with anything that's any newer than what what I showed on your show the, a right. while ago. So if you're into that, uh, tune in to Great. Charge TV. Uh, structural batteries combine two functions in a car. Where else can combinational function be designed in your opinion? How about, how about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that would work. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, things that can make that happen. Quite frankly, we've been looking at why is it that we have um, a separate box for the inverter and another separate box for the electric motor mm -hmm. and another box for the, for the transmission and whatever. Why don't we just make it so that the cradle and all of those other components are in one big lump? That's the way they make tractors. I mean, uh, in the olden days, they made tractors that way. You had one big giant casting and everything went into it and you never had to worry about anything. The thing was beefy. It didn't, it doesn't have to be that beefy now, but, but if we're looking at, um, if we're looking at, um, uh, you know, a bunch of little castings, why don't we just have one big casting and it would be the powertrain casting and everything would go into it. The, uh, the two electric, mo the electric motor, the, the, the gearbox, the whatever, everything goes into that one box, done. And mm -hmm. then you just, and, you, and now I only have one station on the line. So instead of having the cradle go in and all the other stuff, everything goes in at the same time and it's all one big giant casting. And quite frankly, one of the things that we saw on the Mach-E was uh, their use of, of uh, hollow cast uh, uh, products. And uh, that's what made me decide to buy um, a Mach-E and start taking it, tearing it apart. Okay. So. Uh, question here, for 50 years, we've been reducing the weight of vehicles. EVs are heavier. Did we miss something during the design stage of EVs? Now, I mean, the reason that EVs batteries. are heavier is because of the batteries. Everything yeah. else is lighter. So basically everything that we're talking about with the solid state and, and, and battery advancement is going to gradually right. reduce the weight of everything over right. time. And yeah. I so, often think about that the, the, the billions of man hours that went into ICE vehicles and how we are just at the millions of man hours of engineering in EVs. Yeah. So it, things are going to get so much better just yeah. in the next 10 or 20 years. Yeah, I, I'm guessing that you underestimated, I would say trillions, yeah. trillions of, of, of man hours have gone into, uh, into ICE vehicles and we're just scratching the surface. This is like uh, the, um, um, with that crash that happened on, um, in uh, Texas. Okay, so everybody now is jumping on this bandwagon. Hey, we got to get rid of, um, we got to get rid of autopilot and self-driving because look mm -hmm. at that, two guys, I don't even know how they did it. We tried to reproduce that here. It couldn't do it. In fact, that's on TMZ. You mean dr driving, driving, not being in the seat? You yeah, tried to well, they were, they were in the passenger seats and in yeah. the back seat. How you do that would be on me. I have no clue. Mm -hmm. We tried to, uh, I tried to uh, put the car in gear and everything from the passenger seat. Oh, I got it to go in gear, but I couldn't reach the accelerator to get it going. Um, and when I did try, <laughs> I wound up with a cramp that uh, <laughs> I said, okay, Sandy's had enough. This is it. I'm done. So I think that, um, I think, I don't know how they did what they did. I, I clueless, but I know one thing for sure. Self-driving or sorry, not self-driving because it's not even close to that yet, but autopilot is eight times better, eight times better than, um, than, uh, 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 an individual behind a steering wheel. It's a half a million miles between accidents and it's, uh, it's uh, 4 million miles for autopilot. This is an, this, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure this map out. This is like mm -hmm. the way to go. Yeah. Sure. But it, rest assured every, every uh, accident that occurs will be all over the news <laughs> in any case. Well, uh, it's so uh, what is it if it, if it bleeds, it reads mm -hmm. or something. Yeah. Cindy, can you elaborate on what you think the cost of a Tesla Model 3 car would be at the end of the decade? Cheap. Uh, from a cost or sell price? I think they probably mean like an MSRP. Okay, so I'm guessing that by 2030, 
Mm. Now, I have to take into account that we have a shortage of a bunch of raw materials. Mm -hmm. I think it'll be at the same price, but everything else will go up by double or triple. So I think it's gonna hold its price um, by the time you get to 2030, you'll be able to buy a Model 3 for about 38, 38 grand, something like that. In, the, in, in, in 2030 dollars, because they, they keep doing stuff like this and making it less expensive. And I'm positive that, uh, that Elon Musk uh, says, oh, I don't like hydrogen and I don't like uh, solid state batteries because they're, I bet you dollars, the donuts, he's got people working on it right now. Mm -hmm. So that'll, that'll reduce, reduce the cost and reduce the waste as well. But, Telling you those bigger batteries, the 4680s, they 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 bring the cost down a lot. 16%, I think, uh, from a cost or 30% from a cost and 16% from weight. I, I can't remember the numbers right now, but anyways, it's quite a bit quite a bit of a difference. Gotcha. Um, how soon do you think other OEMs will replicate the mega casting strategy? Well, what you have to do is you have to think that they've got billions and billions of dollars invested in body shops. Um, in Europe, um, closing down a body shop would, re would remove hundreds of workers. And it's very difficult in Europe to get rid of people. They uh, have a lot of rules about that. So my guess is that, um, and then there's the other, the other guys, the finance guys. Finance guys like steel, it's cheap per pound. They don't look at anything else. They just look at how much is that per pound? And so I think that you're gonna find that the standard OEMs are gonna be the last adopters for that sort of stuff. And the new vehicle companies, uh, the ones that are coming out, <laughs> I'm sure hope whatever that fell down <laughs> wasn't too expensive. <laughs> Anyways, um, uh, the uh, the other uh, vehicle companies, the new ones, the um, they're they're probably they're probably going to make the switch because they're not making their own stampings; they're having somebody else do them, and then they either weld them together themselves or they're buying a whole body from somebody else. They're going to be the the real adopters. But Tesla, Tesla hasn't had much fun. Elon Musk had to work in a in a in a body plant. He's probably not going to be real anxious. Uh, to go and put anybody through the, um, what do you call it, factory hell that he had mm -hmm. himself. So gotcha. I, I don't see anybody rushing out to, to get that unless there's a huge change in management at one of the companies. Great. So uh, another question here, um, Sandy, of all the EV startups since Tesla, it seems like Rivian has the best chance of success. Do you agree yes. and do you think see any others uh, that look as promising? Rivian is the most promising. I agree. Um, there are a lot of other issues with, I, th none of the other plants that I know of, um, well, let me re rephrase that. Okay, so we're talking about big, big companies like Rivian. But I see um, a lot of smaller companies that are, are definitely going to succeed. They mm -hmm. haven't been given a huge amount of money. And so consequently, they haven't learned how to spend a huge amount of money. So they're, they're kind of struggling a little bit. But I believe that, um, that um, Aptera, uh, who is making a solar, basically a solar car, uh, three-wheel solar car. I believe that they're going to be um, they're going to be um, um, they're going to be moving ahead. Mm, hang on a second. Um, I, there's two other companies that I could mention, but I'm not sure whether I can or not. Aptera, I know I have clearance for, but um, Archimoto, I I'm going to say Archimoto. I think that Archimoto is going to be another giant winner. Mm -hmm. um, can you, um, can you maybe remind me Lucid. 
Is that what, what's our key motor again? What, what kind of vehicle? Our, these are all three wheel vehicles. Okay, right. They're That's... the ones that are that don't have any real competition right now, mm -hmm. and they're probably going to do remarkably well. So, yeah. um, those those are the ones that I think are going to pop up because <laughs> really. People would like to have something that's electric, but they don't want to have a gigantic bill to go along with it. And these things are relatively inexpensive. They're nimble. You can take them for long rides. Actually, the Aptera uh, uh, vehicle, um, they claim you can get a thousand miles between charges because it's solar. And if you're below the Mason-Dixon line, you can make it go forever. Um, Archimoto, um, Archimoto's got a tremendous uh, number of people uh, interested in their products. And the reason for that is because they're the fun utility vehicle. Mm -hmm. And it is fun. I've driven lots of lots and lots of different cars and uh, and whatnot. And uh, uh, I like the three wheel vehicles because they're fast and uh, they're nimble and uh, they don't cost much. And I can park them anywhere. Uh, you know, they're they're basically a three-wheeled motorcycle. That's, mm -hmm. that's what they're uh, they're at, and so I think that that I think that people that are urban, especially in, living in urban areas like downtown Detroit or something like that, this is a perfect this is a perfect deal. I can park it on a, you know, if you got an apron in front of your apartment building, I can stick it there. Uh, it's easy, sure. easy to find a parking spot for that. New right. York would be a much better spot, I guess. Yeah, I would I would agree, uh, Rivian. In terms of uh, passenger, you know, competition for the for the big three, yeah. uh, Rivian's a good one. Um, and then there's lots of also commercial vehicles, but buses and 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 trucks and and Proterra is doing great. Uh, yeah. BYD here, uh, and then I would also add Lucid. I think Rollison seems to have a really good plan. Um, I don't know that much about his platform. I don't I don't know if you do either. Do you have any thoughts on Lucid? Um, no, because we've never worked with them. And I've never really okay. done a deep dive on them. But you know, um, one thing that we haven't talked about is the real market, which is the Chinese market. Mm -hmm. Those guys, um, they will be dominating the American market very soon. Their cars are as well built as anybody on the planet. And by the way, I remember when people said, oh, Japanese cars are junk right, in the 70s and early 80s. Yep. And then, oh, what happened? The world turned. The world turned from Japanese junk to high quality, Japanese mm -hmm. high quality. Okay, so everybody figures that, oh, well, you know, China, drink umbrellas, or, or maybe I'm getting a cheap suit or something. Au contraire, those, those cars are really well built, and I've driven mm -hmm. many of them. The gaps are perfect. The seats are delightful. The instrumentation is wonderful. The electronics, they make all the electronics. We don't do anything here. So this kind of stuff, they, they're very deep in. They make, uh, they make your cell phone. All, all, of, all of this stuff is being done in China. We gave it up. Again, those finance guys that I talked about earlier. Oh, can we get a cheaper, okay. Oh, look at, we can get rid of all of these workers. We can get rid of all these engineers. Let's just give it to China. We'll put our little badge on it and we make a shitload of money. That kind of stuff is what, um, that's what kills companies and countries. We almost, yeah. we almost went under based on, uh, because everybody loved Japanese cars. And I think people are gonna love Chinese cars as well. Neo, Xping, uh, BYD, B... Beijing Automotive, Geely. <laughs> there's a lot of, there's a, and Geely, by the way, Geely owns um, uh, Volvo, among other things. Mm -hmm. I think you're going to see a big, big change in who's the big dog uh, in the very near future. By 2025, there's going to be a lot of unlucky um, car plants in North America. Yeah. China certainly had a strategy to make EVs. Um... Yeah into uh, as as an opportunity to leapfrog and it, it seems like it's working michael dunn um has a great newsletter uh i can't remember the name of his site right now but uh find, look for him on twitter and follow his uh, uh chinese ev coverage it's really good yeah all right yeah. um let me see a couple i think we have time for a few more questions sure 
Will the recording of this session be available? Yes, uh, you can find it on our website. Uh, yeah, the truck. Bah, 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 bah. One second here. Okay, here we go. And Tesla says stainless steel in the cyber truck saves three thousand dollars <laughs> stamping assembly and three thousand dollars in paint. So when batteries are at parity with ice, a Camry class sedan. Tesla could be about 6K less expensive. Wouldn't that be impossible for Toyota to match because profit margins are already slim on Camry class vehicles? Well, well that, we're not talking. Yeah, <laughs> we're not talking about the same class, but maybe if you could uh, just elaborate a little bit on what you think about uh, Cybertruck and, and uh, the potential for, for savings, cost savings there. Yeah, okay. So we were talking about what can you integrate with the Cybertruck um, that's an exoskeleton kind of uh, vehicle. So what's behind me is an endoskeleton. This is, um, this has a skin that's thin and gives you the look. And then in back of it are these uh, rugged manly looking uh, um, structures that, uh, that, that in essence give you the strength, the rigidity for rollover or uh, side crash, T-bone crash or things like that. Uh, so all these different crashes and whatnot have things inside that, uh, that, uh, that protect the occupants. With uh, what I've been told about, because I've never seen one, and uh, again, Tesla doesn't send me drawings, I don't know. <laughs> but, but anyway, what I'm told is that they have a true exoskeleton. And that's how we were gonna build that little airplane. This is, um, this was um, um, an exoskeleton design. In other words, there were no ribs and longerons. There were no, no nothing. This was the skin inside, outside. And we were gonna, you know, put insulation and, uh, and something to like a headliner if, 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 if on this stuff. But the rest of it, I made it uh, a thicker, a thicker pieces of aluminum, thicker pieces of aluminum and, um, and just stamped them, boom, done. I don't, I don't have any welding. I don't have any, um, I don't have any rivets. I don't have any toggle locks, nothing. It's just done. It's all one piece. And uh, that gives you the strength. The outside gives you the strength. That's kind of back to that question we had before of, is there any other options that we can have besides that, the castings? Well, the casting is gonna be the platform for the, uh, for the, um, cyber truck and then you've got this exoskeleton that clunk on top done that that's a that's a big deal and i should have thought of that but i didn't so i apologize to the guy hopefully you didn't get mad and hang up so um but there's the other one that's mm -hmm. the other good example of what what can be done with um with a integrated system here's here's uh one one question i have a uh... I have a strong opinion on when do you think Apple will release their car? I tend to think Apple will never build a car. Uh, there will be rumors about it forever, but I don't think it, they're ever going to actually do it. What do you think? I don't know. I don't think, I don't think financially they find it um, yeah. worthwhile. I think mm -hmm. that uh, Apple may look at maybe some of the componentry and whatnot inside a vehicle. I mean, really and truly their, their strong suit is uh, electronics and communication. Mm -hmm. Seems to me that, uh, you know, the screens, the instrumentation underneath uh, that you can't see, the, the electronics box and stuff like that, they, they're, they're good at miniaturization. That's where mm -hmm. they should look, I think. That would be my guess. I, I think but, if, I, if I could, I think that a lot of confusion comes because they have immense R&D. So they'll hire, they, they obviously hired lots of engineers from Tesla and other places, and they talk to various manufacturers and they may have prototypes, but they're, they're doing that in, in lots of areas. I don't, I think like, I think they'll come to the same conclusion Dyson came to, which is, this isn't, this isn't for us. <laughs> yeah. And, this is much harder than we frankly, were. Well, it's not so much as much harder. I'm sure I'll crank something out, but they'd have to have a lot of partners and, yeah. um, you know, maybe they would go with somebody like Magna who, um, is, they make cars for other companies, mm -hmm. um, so they they might they might do that. 
Uh, but uh, uh, that's what Fisker, I don't want to go there. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, who makes <laughs> the wheel motor? <laughs> give me, give me a, yeah, what's that? Who, who makes the wheel motor in front of Sandy? I think really you say that was Protean. Protean. Protean okay. makes this one, and the one that's going into the um, Lordstown vehicle is called uh, Alafe. I would pick this one though for the VTOL, and the reason for that is because this has got the inverter built into it. That's what this block down here is. This is a cool idea. I'd, I'd want to have it so that if I've got a bad motor, I don't have to screw around trying to pull something else out. I pull two wires out, put this thing in place, boom, done. I'm flying again. I like that idea. So this would be the one I'd pick for VTOL. Sandy, do you wish you had... Do you, do you wish you had been working on EV technology earlier rather than conventional ICE technologies? Well, there wasn't much of an industry to work well, there in. there was. <laughs> mm. Okay. So, um, yeah, we worked on some um, um, electric vehicles. Um, they were just, uh, they were powered by a different way. <laughs> electric boat. Um, they make lots of submarines. And, um, and mm. so does... Um, and so does uh, BA Systems um, in, in England. Uh, so we worked on the Virginia class submarine and uh, also we did a lot more work on the um, HMS Astute. So we worked on big electric products. And then um, <clears throat> most ships, most big ships that are efficient have a, um, mm, they have electric drives. So, mm -hmm. um, They'll have a turbine to uh, to get the um, get the energy that they need, turn it into electricity, and then the electricity goes to the giant electric motors. So we worked on those. But the thing that um, that most people don't know is that, um, and we just celebrated the 20th or 25th anniversary of the EV1. I think it was 25, and Monroe was brought in very early uh, on that vehicle. Yeah. To, uh, to help it out. So I did get a chance to work on it, but I also saw that um, the big companies really don't, didn't, uh, GMs, like, uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't wanna, I don't wanna go down that path either really. It's kind of sad, but, but Bob Stemple, great guy, smart guy. He was the chairman, Lloyd Royce, those guys all got shuffled off uh, off the stage uh, for even attempting um, the uh, the EV1. I thought it was a travesty that they crushed up those vehicles and threw them away. Mm -hmm. We we hit every target except for one. We didn't hit range. But now uh, I think the EV1, if they could just you know, start producing that right now, change the battery pack to something worthwhile, you know, do an upgrade here and there. That card sell right this very second. I, I think, I think there's a lot of people that would like to have a, <clears throat> a $25,000 car. Mm -hmm. And I think I can make it for that. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. So one last question here and then we'll let you go. Thanks so much for your time. Okay. We really appreciate it. Um, Ain't no problem. Standardizing <laughs> of battery packs help reduce cost. Do you think uh, we will ever see some sort of standardization for battery packs uh, in some niche uh, areas? Um, why or why not? Well, <clears throat> we can't even standardize on a, <laughs> on a battery plug. I don't know. It ain't going to happen. This is going to be something that's going to separate this company from that company to that company. Mm -hmm. Nobody's gonna standardize on anything. <clears throat> They're gonna tell the market that that's the differentiator between them and those other fools. And like I say, I'm not a finance guy and I'm, I'm not a, a marketing guy either, uh, but um, I know how they think and, um, and that's gonna be a differentiator. No, there won't be any standardization. Just like, like I said, can't even standardize on a plug. All I sure. want to do is get my charge. All I want to do is shove something in and have it work all the time. <clears throat> but now you got, oh, let's put this connector together. Let's put that connector together. Mm -hmm. 
until somebody comes along with, um, that's where the SAE, Society of Automotive Engineers, should stand up and be counted. And they should come up and find out which is the best way, which is the most economical way, which is the simplest way to make all this stuff happen. And um, recharging that plugs. Isn't what I see. Yeah, charging plugs. Okay. They should all be the same. I mean, have you ever gone to England? Like great big clunking thing. That's yeah. on one end of the spectrum. And then you've got ours, you know, two prongs go into the wall, no problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no, no reason. We've talked about and you've talked about Tesla's uh, core technology lead, but they also have a wall garden of the supercharger network. And it, you know, as, yeah. as more and more EVs come available from Volkswagen and GM, I think that's going to be a huge difference <clears throat> in addition to everything yeah. else. It's so much, yeah. so much more robust than anything else out there. But I, again, I'll let you go. And we really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Um, Thank this, you. this video will be available uh, to watch on demand. And uh, that concludes our uh, virtual oh, oh, conference. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait oh. a minute. I have one thing, one sure. thing. Where's my nieces? Oh, here we go. No, no. I have to do something. My niece, <laughs> my niece right here, um, she, um, she is a cancer survivor. And two or three days ago, she, um, she got her last, uh, her last, uh, her last shot. Uh, actually, it's uh, the final spinal is what the, uh, the card says on the other side. So I'd like to wish Megan a happy life. Don't do the cancer thing any, anymore. That once is enough and here she is. So there you go. That's my shout out for my, my, my niece. All right. Every, <laughs> so everyone's sending their love to Megan. Was that her name, Megan? <laughs> Great. Yeah. Megan. Yep. Megan Patrick. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much, Sandy. We really appreciate you're it. You're welcome. Yep. Take you're, care, everyone. Thanks. Thanks Thank for all so the great questions.